Hi, it's good to have you here. I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. Today's masterclass is about Lekka. What is it? How is it manufactured? Why orchids do well in Lekka? And why sometimes Lekka is blamed for orchids being set back or worst case scenario, die. We will also look into what are the benefits of growing orchids in Lekka and what are the downsides to be aware of. Awareness is key with any media when it comes to orchids, no matter if you grow in organic or inorganic media. Understanding the characteristics of the media that you choose to grow your orchids in is one of the major keys to being successful in growing your orchids. But first I want to apologize for not having enough footage to break up the commentary with visuals, so this would be a good time to consider this a podcast-style masterclass ideal for just listening to the information while maybe going about some chores or whatever it is that you can do while listening. I appreciate that you are here and thank you so much for your time. So let's get into the meat and bones of the information and I briefly touched upon understanding the characteristics of the media you choose to grow your orchids in. That is one of the major keys to being successful in growing your orchids. That is, if you happen to have to even contemplate media and not grow them al fresco. Different climates and growth spaces have different influences, which in turn influence how any media behaves and how the orchids respond, thrive, or don't do well at all. How I use Lekka may work great in my growing conditions, but in your climate, you may have to tweak a few details so that the same media will give the same results for your environment, climate, and circumstances. I hope that this masterclass will be helpful, give a deeper understanding of Lekka and remove any stigma surrounding it, because yes, growing in Lekka has a certain stigma attached to it, mainly because of the opinions that it is just a fad. I would appreciate it if you would give this video a thumbs up, sharing it around if you feel so inclined, and if you have not subscribed, take a moment to do so right now, hit the notification bell and set it to all, seeing as I go live as well, this way you won't miss the alerts for upcoming lives, or the standard video notifications. Thank you so much for being so supportive. Back to our Lekka and the whole stigma about the media just being a fad. As with anything new, depending on the marketing of the industry that want to push their product, a new trend will become a fad for a certain period of time and then quickly fade into oblivion. Because we are so accustomed to the routine of what works for our orchids, it is hard to veer into a direction that takes us out of our comfort zone. If we want to debunk Lekka as being a fad, from my perspective, I am going to say that back in the 80s, when growing houseplants in Lekka and self-watering, when that first appeared on the scene, it was a fad. Only a certain few took to this new method of growing houseplants, and I was one of them. I was in Germany at the time, and when I saw this stuff, the pots, and how clean everything would be within my home, I was sold on the concept and went to town. After several months of painstaking cleaning of root systems of houseplants, including those palm trees we see in garden centers, I had everything in Lekka and self-watering and never looked back. So my history with Lekka goes back decades. However, it was not available in Spain when I moved here in the late 80s. So my orchids went back into bark, and whatever I could scrounge as adequate organic media for the orchids. Back then, internet shopping and shipping of anything and everything was not a thing. So, fast forward to 2017, and I was starting to research the orchids that I have now. I saw Lekka in the garden center. It looked different, but it felt the same, so I bought a bag, only to get home and realize that what I had bought would not sink at all. It was the floaty kind. In case you didn't know, <laughs> There's some lecker that just floats all the time. <laughs> but that is useless for a setup of self-watering or semi-hydroponics. However, if this floaty stuff was around, that means the right lecker is not far away. And sure enough, another garden center had the right stuff. And here we are today. If you are crafty, patient and ambitious, you can make your own lecker by doing what the mass producers do. Just take raw clay... If it is too dry, add a little water to create a paste. If the clay has some chunks in it, you will need a pestle and mortar to grind it into a fine paste and then start rolling the paste into individual balls depending on the size that you want. Make sure that you have an oven with heat-resistant glass that permits a temperature of 
1,150 degrees Celsius. Proceed to bake your clay balls for as long as it takes for them to dry out. They will pop like popcorn as they reach the maximum temperature, and that is why the glass of your oven has to be of a different quality. <laughs> Once your clay balls have popped, your lecker is done, allowed to cool down slowly. Et voila, you have yourself homemade lecker. Well, not quite. Do not try this at home, but, you know, in a roundabout way, that is how Lekka is made. One cubic square meter of clay turns into five cubic square meters of Lekka. The difference with the manufacturers of Lekka is that they have rotary kilns that replace the rolling out of the clay into balls more efficiently. <laughs> Maybe I should have mentioned the quantity increase of clay balls going into your oven compared to lecker coming out of your oven. It is exponential. <laughs> a small quantity of clay goes a long way. Yeah, well, it wasn't called light expanded clay aggregate for nothing. <laughs> expanded being the key here. Anyway, moving on. If we look at the benefits of lecker as it is applied in construction before it made its way into our plant pots as a form of medium, we find the following. Stability, reduced settlements, reduced earth pressure, drainage, insulation, frustability, limited compaction, low density, and ease of handling. From a construction point of view, lacquer is amazing and cost-affected, but look at that list again and now think orchids. Stability, we can interpret that as it won't break down. Reduced settlements, it won't compact. Reduced earth pressure. Well, <clears throat> not sure <laughs> how that would apply to orchids, but it is interesting for an engineering and architectural geek like me. <laughs> Drainage. Well, well, well. How often do we hear that orchids need media with good drainage? Insulation. I have as yet to determine how that works with orchids, but it is interesting when thinking about the evaporative cooling effect that lecker has based on pot size. Smaller pots with lecker will result in higher evaporative cooling than larger pots, which is something to be mindful of when growing warm to hot growers in semi-hydro if you grow your orchids with a calendar seasons where temperature drops in winter are a thing and you do not use heat mats. Frostability? Well, I doubt that is something that we need to worry about when it comes to the orchids we generally grow. Maybe a little neo here or there. At least, you know, if you're growing it in Lekka, <laughs> that Lekka is resistant to frost. <laughs> Limited compaction. We already addressed that in reduced settlements. Low density and ease of handling. The ease of handling is what I appreciate about this media, seeing as many orchids grow to a certain size and the pots do not get overly heavy if sticking with lightweight plastic pots. Expanding on that list. <laughs> See what I did there? Expanding. <laughs> anyway, expanding on those benefits and why lecker works well for orchids, we can add less repotting because the lecker doesn't break down less pH variants, and I will address pH in more detail just now, easier to treat pests, it is inert, so dosing of fertilizer and supplements come with full control, it is easy to store and always ready for use. And one of the most important benefits to me as an orchid collector, less financial strain over time, meaning lecker can be and should be recycled. Now, to every positive, there may be a negative. So let's explore what the downsides of Lekka could be for our orchids. Awareness is key. This does not mean that orchids will fail in Lekka, but as always, if something is too good to be true, then there are red flags we need to look out for, right? So, taking the last benefit point and turning that into a negative, the initial cost of Lekka is quite high, if you're transitioning a large collection, but it is not as high as bark is in the long term. But then there's the other cost of lecker. That would be the learning curve of growing orchids in it at first, and the dangers of incurring possible losses by making mistakes along the way. So it can be costly at the beginning, just as much as it is cheaper in the long run. However, I am hoping that not only this video, but my channel, will greatly reduce any orchids being lost, so your success rate is high right out of the gate. Or at least, 
give an understanding of what went wrong, when it did, if it did, and avoiding any future repeat errors that result in an orchid's demise. We can also turn the positive of keeping pots lightweight as the orchids grow to size and turn that into a negative because top-heavy orchids are at risk of toppling over until they are rooted in securely in the pot. Keeping a freshly potted orchid in Lekka without a support is near to impossible, especially if the roots are chunky and do not grow a large branching network. The water quality also needs to be excellent. Turning the control part into a negative, if we were to analyze that, because now we'd have to also talk about water. The water quality needs to be excellent, be it rainwater, distilled water, reverse osmosis water, or tap water that does not reach more than 100 parts per million in total dissolved solids. That is a negative if for some reason a clean water source is not always available. Evaporative cooling can pose issues with some orchids if grown without a heat mat during cooler temperatures. The cleaning process of Lekka out of the bag ready for use with the orchids is time consuming if done right, as is the cleaning process of the Lekka that has to be recycled after a repot. That is, if you are like me, who reuses and recycles everything that comes out of my pots and don't throw the pot content away. Anyway, what a great seg into the best practices for cleaning lecker. I have several videos about that already, which I will link in the description, including one that is called Dirty Lecker. And I don't mean dirty because of dust, but dirty because of shards due to lack of quality. That video is an eye-opener and I recommend you watch it. It will save you money and possibly prevent any root damage to happen to your orchids. You can find that linked in the description. So let's talk about the best practices for cleaning Lekka straight out of the bag. Please know that my advice and method of cleaning Lekka is based on avoiding any excess salt buildup in your pots once you have your orchid in Lekka and think we're good to go. It is important to know that some manufacturing processes of Lekka are not as clean as we would like them to be. And with that, the preparation of the clay before going into the kiln can include additives which, once the Lekka is cooled down, remain trapped in the pores. Upon contact with water and the wicking characteristics of Lekka, these additives will find their way to the surface of the pot where they will appear as a white residue as the water evaporates at the surface. Depending on the brand, Lekka can contain a lot of residual salts or not much at all. Don't know that just by looking at it unless you have a reliable source where you can get your Lekka and have had recommendations that tell you this doesn't have any residual salts when you get it out of the bag. It may be dusty, but it won't be salty. <laughs> anyway, seeing as I'm not an expert in which brand is best, because I only have limited access to the Lekka that I use, but to emphasize the point I want to make about cleaning of the Lekka, to be as pedantic as possible, I will explain my history with one brand that I tested out after the first floaty experience. <laughs> it was from a hydroponic store and you would think that makes a lot of sense and they know what they are selling, but it was awful because it reeked of paraffin, which is often a component used in the production of Lekka as when it is impregnated into the pores of Lekka during the production process, it is there to leak proof Lekka something that can be beneficial depending on what the lekker is used for, but paraffin impregnated lekker is mainly used in construction. That kind of lekker has no business being anywhere near our orchids. Many, many cheap brands use paraffin as well in getting their lekker, and we'll get to that. So, side note, if you open a new bag of lekker and you rinse it free of the dust for the first time, and there's an odor of paraffin, do not use that brand. I had it at first, but the pH of the water dropped to 4.2 and no amount of soaking to leach out the residual paraffin would be sufficient. If you smell that, find another brand that does not smell of anything to do with gasoline. Paraffin treated lecker is a fast and cheaper way to get the clay to temperature for it to pop and expand. Non-paraffin treated clay takes longer and for that reason is more expensive because it takes longer to heat up. 
Paraffin treated LECA is aimed at enhancing thermal performance in buildings. It has no business being in our pots. For that reason, even extensive cleaning, boiling and leaching will not result in removing the paraffin residue to make the LECA safe for our orchids. Speaking of cleaning, let's get back to that. So my method of cleaning is the following. I rinse the new LECA straight out of the bag to get rid of the initial dust. Then I boil it in the cleanest water that I have, which is my reverse osmosis water. The reason being, the heat of the next step will expand the LECA and if the water is high in parts per million, then the salts of the water will find their way into the pores of the LECA and we are back to square one with trying to clean our LECA as best as possible. The cleaning of the LECA is not just based on what we can see going into the drain by form of dust, it extends to leaching out as much of the residual salt as we possibly can. So use the cleanest water when you boil your lecker and that will leach out a lot of the initial salts. Once you get that water to boiling, boil at least for 10 minutes, 20 minutes depending on the size of your batch. But the point is to get the temperature into all the lecker right into the center of each lecker bead being clean. Then, important. Use boiling hot clean water to strain your freshly boiled LECA. Do not use cold water because there's a lot of gunk in the water as you strain your LECA and you now add cold water, you're immediately closing the pores of the LECA that also have gunky water in them. So keep that same energy with the boiling of the LECA when you strain and rinse. Use boiling hot clean water to rinse. And if you have to boil a kettle over and over and over again to get your batch rinsed, please do that. It is worth it. Following all that, I recommend that you measure the parts per million and the pH of the water you're going to store your LECA in before adding the LECA because ready to use LECA should stay submerged in water even when repotting is not on the horizon. I will get to the reasons of why just now. But in order to continue the cleaning process and get a good idea as to what, if any residual salts are still in the new LECA, leaching for several days is something that we should not ignore. Take note of your starting parts per million of the water and the pH and then in 24 hours measure the parts per million and pH again. If your parts per million have risen by more than 100 within the 24 hours, then you need to drain that water and soak the LECA again with fresh, clean water. Checking your pH is important afterwards as well because even though LECA is inert, it does not mean that it will not take on the pH of your water or change the pH because your water may have a different pH, if that makes sense. Your water is your indicator as to what you are dealing with with your new batch of LECA and it is important for when you use it in the future for your orchids once they get potted up. Repeat the measuring after 24 hours again and see where you are at with the parts per million and pH. If your parts per million has not risen much at all after the second leaching, then leave your lecker in that water for another 24 hours, making that 48 hours and then measure again. Do that without changing the water. So extend the time frame between checking your parts per million and rinsing out the water and refreshing the water. Extend that over the hours or the days and see how slowly or how fast your parts per million rise or stay steady. If they don't rise heavily, extend it even further. This gives you a great idea of how little salts are left in your lecker. When you have found the point where the parts per million are steadying out, to approximately 100 as opposed to maybe when it started out at 500 then you're good to go get yourself some more of the cleanest water and that is how you store your lecker and keep that lecker submerged because when it comes to using it sporadically you don't want your lecker to float depending on the brand of lecker this process of leaching and measuring and changing the water can take from one up to two weeks as has been the case in my case, the pH is something personal to you and your water. As an example, my pH is 8. My mains water is so bad that my RO water does not come out at 7. So, my lecker is stored in water with a pH of 8. Meaning, 
that on any repot, that is where my pH is at. And I compensate that by pHing lower when it comes to the nutrient solution. I am only bringing that point up again because people say that Lekka is inert, but they confuse it with neutral. Inert meaning it won't change the pH of the water being poured into the pot, but it is not neutral if the water that it is stored in is not neutral. Lekka will take the pH of the water it is stored in most of the time. If you have any questions on that, please let me know in the comments. I know that this is long-winded. I know it can be a little bit rambly, but this is important. So if you have any questions, ask away in the comments. And I'm going to emphasize again that it is tedious and we're talking about a fresh bag of Lekka. My leaching and rinsing and filling with fresh water process can take up to two weeks. The longer that I leave my new Lekka in the water to leach with as little change in the PPM, that is what I'm looking for to know that I don't have to change the water anymore and it is just stored submerged in a sealed container for months and months and months until I'm ready to use it again. Now that really is a labor of love, <laughs> but it is important to take the cleaning process seriously because only in having done that can you determine if any salt buildup on the surface of your pots is because of over fertilizing, lack of humidity or both. And if I didn't mention it before, I'm going to say it now. If I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but keep your lacquer submerged in the water. The reason being, if you want to repot, your lacquer won't float. Because of the pores, everything that we did before, opening them up and filling the, all the nooks and crannies through the boiling process, the lecca is heavy and full of water. Keeping that lecca submerged in water will not allow the water to evaporate. If you prefer to let the lecca dry out and store it dry, then of course that is an option, but know that it will not be ready for use immediately and needs to be soaked in water for at least a day, two or three days before it sinks. It can take quite some time to get Lekka full with water again so that it loses its buoyancy and floaty characteristics. <laughs> That's just a little side note so that you're not caught off guard if there is anything like an emergency repot you have to undertake and you store your Lekka dry. Now, everything I just mentioned was referring to a brand new bag of Lekka. However, once the Lekka has lived in your pots for the years that it has and you repot the orchid, cleaning the root bowl to then pot it up in a bigger pot, the recycling part is not as tedious when it comes to measuring pH and TDS. The labor of love in that instance turns to ridding the Lekka of any residual old velamen, steely or debris that has accumulated in the pot. Usually, old velamen comes off relatively easy with a rub of a fingernail. I have a little scrubby brush that I use if I have to take after a stubborn velamen on Lekka, but that is very rare. However, <laughs> there is velamen out there that is papery thin, obnoxiously attached to any Lekka and the most ridiculous chore to get off, and that is the velamen of Catacetone. <laughs> oh boy, I take my time when it comes to cleaning Lekka after a Catacetone a sitem repot <laughs> and if it means taking two days to get a batch ready to get to the boiling stage then so be it that is not the only reason that i do not repot my catacetone every year but it sure is one of them usually the velamen comes off really really easy it's not that difficult and it doesn't matter if not all the velamen is removed it will not affect the sterilization process for storage nor will it have any negative effects in the new pot it is just annoying to see that you've missed some, but won't prove detrimental to anything in the future. I find that once I have repotted an orchid into recycled lecca and the surface dries off, that is when I see old velamen make an appearance as it dries. It's just something that I accept. The reason that the odd old velamen here and there will have no adverse effect on lecca that is recycled is because... The same process of cleaning new lecca out of the bag is applied to recycling lecca. The heat of the boil will kill off any pathogens. That residual velamen will be toast as well. Allow me to briefly touch upon the evaporative cooling that could be a detriment to warm, hot growing orchids in cooler climates, as in my case during the winter months and not using heat mats. Anyway, thank you so much if you're still here with me. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh. Thank you.
as per what I mentioned about low density, if you have a warm to hot grower and you are concerned about cooler temperatures during your year, then I advise you to use a larger pot for that orchid because the exterior parameters of the pot, not just the surface, but all around, will have a slightly cooler temperature than the interior, meaning that the roots further into the pot are not going to have the evaporative cooling affect them the way that the exterior roots would be affected. That is not to freak anyone out. I have been growing in Lekka for the past five years and I have not used heat mats for the past three years. I have lost orchids to Lekka and not understanding the different balances even while using heat mats. And I have lost orchids to Lekka because I did not understand the balances without using heat mats. So blaming the Lekka for evaporative cooling be a detriment to the orchid is not exactly fair. It is something to be mindful of, however, but any media can cool down around the outer perimeter of the pot while the interior stays warmer. It has to do with the ambient temperature. Now, of course, Lekka is a cooler media than lava rock or bark, and that characteristic is compounded by water, which also is a cooling agent, seeing as we do not pour hot water into our pots. The moment room temperature water touches Lekka, that water will cool to whatever temperature the Lekka has and is then considered a double whammy when it comes to cold temperatures. Still, managing Lekka temperatures based on ambient air is feasible if the pot size allows for the cooling effect not to reach too far into the pot and even warm to hot growing orchids will make it through the months where things can get a little bit dicey, no matter the grow method, setup or media. I have a playlist titled Everything Semi-Hydro, where I have a lot of videos that touch upon the Lekka size versus the root size, vigor of the orchid, how to deal with cooler temperatures, and keep the root system happy, repots, you name it. If I do not have it all covered, then future videos will follow to fill in the blanks, so I will link that playlist in the description as well. But if you found valuable nuggets of intel in this masterclass, please give this video a like. If you know someone that could benefit from this video, the share button is there for you to abuse at your leisure. <laughs> if you happen to have any questions based on what I mentioned in this video, behold, there is a comment section. And that is where I would love to clarify, expand, there is that word again, pun intended, and continue the conversation by answering any questions you may have or even finish a thought that, well, I didn't because I may have gone off on a tangent. <laughs> Oops. Please let me know in the comments. Know that if you've watched to the end, I so appreciate your time. Thank you so very much. This kind of support is so valuable. I cannot express my gratitude in any other way than just thank you. I appreciate you watching or listening, depending on how you chose to absorb the information in this video. Have yourselves a fabulous day, but I'm going to ask that you stay safe. That's that one last piece of would you please, after the like, share and subscribe, is that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.